Mongolians are voting in a new parliament. At stake, how to spread the wealth of the country's mining boom. The money's rolling in, but the people are still poor. And overshadowing everything, the blight of corruption. What are the challenges ahead for Mongolia's new government? This is Inside Story. Hello there, thanks for joining us. I'm Shuli Ghosh. Thursday is a crucial day for the people of Mongolia. They're choosing their next government. And the question for voters is this. How should this poor, landlocked country spend the money from its mining boom? A third of Mongolia's three million people live below the poverty line. Many say they haven't seen any benefit from the massively growing economy. And the biggest danger to Mongolia's future comes from corruption. Steve Chow reports. Mongolia is the world's most sparsely populated country. And so on this, a crucial election day. Many travel long distances from the remote grasslands by bus and by more traditional means, turning a car park at this rural polling station into a stable. What is important to me is that there will be leaders with a genuine Mongolian way of thinking who really care for the people. Corruption is so bad, and right now there is no equality. Half is getting richer, the other half poorer. With the newfound wealth of a nation at stake, government officials pledged to reflect the will of the public with a clean election. Independent observers have been invited in. Security cameras beam live video from remote areas to other observers in the capital. And for the first time, Mongolians, many of whom are still nomadic herders, are learning how to vote electronically. The catchphrase in these elections echoed by all political parties is to provide a fair and just government. From recent experiences in the past, many people believe that not following through with this promise this time around will carry heavy consequences. In the last parliamentary elections, rioters burned cars and buildings after accusations of widespread vote rigging. Five people were killed. Controversy has risen again this time with supporters of a former president accusing his rivals of making up charges of corruption. With his case before the courts, Nambaran Angpayar, arguably Mongolia's most popular political figure, has been barred from running. That corruption is common among the political elite and that the poor, estimated at one out of every three in the country, have yet to see the benefits of a resource boom. It's something the president admits to. Corruption is a big problem. Because of corruption, because of bad governance, I think most of the emerging societies are failing and failed. We are not to not want to repeat that. Beyond mineral wealth, Mongolians treasured their democracy. Formed in 1990 following the collapse of the Soviet Union, people still wear their finest to vote. And so, under the watchful eye of the country's greatest ruler, Genghis Khan, Mongolians are choosing a new generation of leaders and hoping their choice will ensure an opportunity of prosperity for all. For Inside Story, I'm Steve Chow in Torelz, Mongolia. So, how is the Mongolian government going to handle its booming economy? And what's it going to do about its rampant corruption? Let's bring in today's guests. From Mongolia's capital, Ulaanbaatar, we have Jagal Sekhan Dambadaja joining us via Skype. He's a Mongolian columnist, television host, economist and management consultant. In Hong Kong, Andrew Leung an economist and political commentator. He's also the government of Hong Kong's former representative to Britain. And in Cambridge, David Sneath, Director of Studies in Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of Cambridge and former Director of the University's Mongolia and Inner Asia Study Unit. Gentlemen, warm welcome to all three of you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jagal Sekhan, uh, let's start with you since you are there in the capital. Many are calling this the most important election ever for Mongolia because it's a crucial time and the time for change is now. Yes, it is because... This country is getting uh, such a big revenue from its uh, uh, mines, wealth under the ground. And it's uh, now important how to deal with that revenue for the sake of the people, for the sake of the 
uh, growth becoming uh, the uh, really a uh, uh, life factor for every Mongolian. Yeah, and what's really interesting about this uh, election is that people are really invested in it, aren't they? I mean, the turnout is predicted to be something like 80% or more. Yeah, what I keep hearing now is a little bit lower, but it is it was before closing the uh, boots, but around probably close to 70, which is already very high. Now, you're talking about the, the mineral wealth there. Um, of course, one of the key questions is how that wealth is uh, distributed, uh, Jagal Sekin. And I, I understand that in Ulaanbaatar, where you are in the capital, uh, you can see a, a lot of that wealth in terms of new buildings and new roads. What's it like outside the capital, though? Well, the Mongolian capital is becoming very much, very much modern, very vibrant city. You will see very high rises. 20 plus floors, which is a quite high in this town. And uh, we have, we see more modern restaurants, people, cars, in particular big cars, you know, we, we like horses and probably it's converted to big cars. You will see every car, as I saw the few hours ago, Bentley on the road. Though the roads have still some uh, big uh, potholes, uh, very symbolic to our economy and their current life. And the Ulaanbaatar city people want uh, we want to have a normal life here. Indeed. Let me bring in uh, David. Um, it's funny that massive traffic jams are always a, a sign of burgeoning wealth. But th this is the key election is, uh, issue, isn't it? The, the, the fairer distribution of, of wealth. Absolutely it is. Um, Mongolia has seen this enormous resource boom just beginning. And as it's as important in terms of expectation as it is in terms of actual delivered uh, material standards of living. So the whole of the country has been promised a lot from the resource boom, which the big mining corporations say is just around the corner. And the difficulty is that Mongolia needs to find a way of distributing that wealth a bit better because the experience of everyday Mongolians since the 90s has been one in which a small section have got wealthy but a lot of the rest of the population haven't seen very much by way of economic benefit over the last 20 years. So the nature of the party politics, including the recent rather dramatic split in the old ruling party, uh, that has really uh, crystallized um, this discussion about what some people are describing as resource nationalism, that is how to negotiate with the big foreign companies to get the best deal for the Mongolian citizen. Um, so that's one of the really important issues. And alongside, as you mentioned in your introduction, is of course the way in which the elites, the political and economic elites are relating to each other, how they handle the wealth that's available. And so the idea of corruption or of underhand dealings of uh, elites feathering their own nests, this is this has made social justice a really central issue in this election campaign. Yeah, and we are going to talk about corruption in a lot more depth because it is an important issue. But it is fair to say that the, the politicians in Mongolia are going to have to work pretty hard to get people's trust back. I think that's true. And I think that um, at the moment, the Mongolian people, the public, which is a very well-informed public, uh, there's a lot of uh, media, television and newspaper coverage, a very good level of general engagement and interest in politics. Uh, the Mongolian public are kind of really going to, um, are waiting to be convinced. There's been a lot of scandal to do with corruption in the last, well, I have to say more than 10, 15, 20 years really. And as the stakes get higher, with more and more money potentially available, people are getting more, um, feeling more strongly about the need for public officials to act in, in, a, in the correct way and also to try and redistribute a bit of this wealth that's coming in. Mm. And Andrew, let me bring you in and, and introduce w one more element to all of this, because we know that the wealth in Mongolia is astounding. Apparently, it's got enough coal there to fuel China's needs for 50 years. So this is clearly a country that, that China is uh, exercising a, l a lot of influence on.
no doubt that China, of course, is Mongolia's uh, biggest uh, customer as far as its resources are concerned. Uh, but the importance of Mongolia to China is more than just resources, um, because uh, Mongolia, of course, uh, sits up north uh, of China uh, as a buffer uh, with Russia. Uh, and also, uh, China sees Mongolia is in a bigger geopolitical context vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, for example, the connections with uh, Central Asia through the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and also uh, involving um, Mongolia uh, regionally uh, in other regions as well. Uh, the, the importance uh, to China is that um, uh, China doesn't want to see uh, Mongolia to be um, uh, getting away from um, uh, into other blocks, for example, uh, with uh, more ally with Russia, um, impinging on China's um, territorial interests, or allying with the United States. For example, the United States has been also increasing in investment in Mongolia, not just for the resources, but also as a global uh, China um, balancing or containment policy that extends, of course, not only uh, to the South China Sea, uh, but also to um, other parts of the world. So uh, for China, uh, Mongolia is part of a global, um, if not just, uh, if uh, it's more than a, a regional, it's a global kind of uh, jigsaw puzzle. Okay. Um, this is a good point to actually just enlighten our viewers about uh, some background on Mongolia. Now, the country is wedged between China and Russia. It has massive deposits of coal, copper, gold and uranium. The government estimates that its mineral reserves are worth around $1.2 trillion. Now, Mongolia's economy grew by 17.3% last year. That's one of the fastest growing in the world. The current elections will be the seventh since Mongolia ended seven decades of communist rule in 1990. But, as we've already mentioned, its democracy is threatened by its high levels of corruption. Mongolia is ranked 120 out of 183 countries on Transparency International's Corruption Index of 2011. Um, we'll come back to corruption in a minute. I just want to ask uh, Andrew this question before I get a reaction from Jagal Seikhan. Um, we were talking about Mongolia's uh, strategic importance and, um, uh, and geographical importance for uh, China. Um, the fact that Mongolia is landlocked uh, with China as being one area where it has to get exports out, China's pretty much exploiting that, isn't it? I mean, it's making Mongolia uh, pay or it's paying Mongolia 30 percent less for its commodities than they would get on the uh, open market. So Mongolia is pretty vulnerable to uh, Chinese influence. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of um, uh, it's open to negotiations, of course. Um, but it, you're quite right that the um, uh, that Mongolia is landlocked, and it requires um, an access to the sea. And the current access is via the eastern um, uh, um, a seaboard of China, particularly in the port near um, uh, Tianjin. Um, and of course, that would be um, uh, China's leverage against a, um, a certain un unwelcome developments. And one of the main worry for China is the uh, possible rise of a pan-Mongolian kind of nationalism, uh, because that would um, uh, give rise to uh, sentiments uh, uniting the Inner Mongolia, which is a, a part of China's province, with Mongolia, and even with a certain uh, Mongolian region in Russia. Well, so that would let, be an unwelcome splitist movement for China. But uh, Jagal Sekhar, I mean, just how worried are people in Mongolia about growing foreign interests? Because there is a, a nationalistic feeling there. They want to control their own wealth. They don't want foreign companies controlling their wealth. Well, I don't uh, want you guys to see that it is too much uh, uh, over blooming all this stuff. Because the, this country uh, has... Uh, 50% of the population is under 35 years old, well-educated. Many of them have uh, foreign education, and they know that what is the best for this country. We need foreign direct investment. Yes, because the mining wealth is not distributed to everybody well. There is, of course, uh, resentment and uh, people not happy. But uh, people are aware that it is because we don't have a good public governance. Remember, this is a democratic country, unlike our two neighbors. And whatever parliament have a decisions, people can uh, go against because it's a democratic country. 
And that's why we, in this country, we uh, have a very broad discussions issue on every issue. That's why it is very difficult sometimes to make one decisions because by nature of the democracy. But however, if it is made, it's for long. And that's, that's the very factor making different this small in terms of population country, different than China and Russia. What do you think, David? I mean, there is a bit of a battle going on, isn't there, between Washington and, and Beijing and uh, lots of global mining companies trying to get uh, a bite of the cherry. Yes, there is. Um, but I'd also just like to mention Mongolian democracy one more time, because I think the point just made just then was a very good one. Uh, Mongolia punches way above its weight in terms of uh, democracy, by which mostly it's meant governments of our type. And Mongolia has very successfully introduced some parliamentary multi-party democracy since the 90s in a most extraordinary um, peaceful coup where something like Tiananmen Square in China resulted not in the tanks rolling over demonstrators but instead in the entire government resigning and introducing a multi-party democracy. And this achievement in the 90s meant that Mongolia has a very active and vibrant political culture but it's become more and more um, problematic because of the relationship with money. The wealth hasn't flowed out very much. The uh, uh, elites have um, seen a lot of wealth, but it tends to be concentrated in a few sectors like mining and so on. So these problems, these internal problems, mean that when it comes to global relations with China and with Russia, Mongolia really does see itself as being... Uh, related to, akin to, uh, European and American and other Western European government systems. Um, it tried to make that statement in terms of its political culture back in the 90s. And so the third neighbour policy, which is how it's described, reaching out beyond the two uh, superpowers that lock Mongolia into this particular position in the continent, reaching out to Washington, yes, but also Berlin and London and Paris and, and Tokyo and other uh, trading partners elsewhere in the, in, in the globe. This is really important for Mongolia, not just politically, but culturally. Um, the elites are very oriented towards this bigger international scene beyond just China and Russia. Mm. And the business deals reflect that. Uh, and of course, as you as you mentioned there, uh, again, the major issue is that this kind of wealth isn't trickling down to uh, the poorer people. So we're back to the issue of corruption. This is the biggest obstacle to the popula population sharing in the, 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 the boom that Mongolia is seeing. Well, in some ways, you could say that that is the case. It's very difficult, though, to be sure quite what um, what Mongolia can do about it, because the resource boom, some kind of resource boom, the equivalent to a petrodollar economy, you know, is not unique to Mongolia. And so it's not as if it, this is a particular product of of rampant corruption. There is there is some corruption. OK, but I think actually the broader question is how one finds a way of transferring wealth from a narrow sector and from elites to a broader part of the population. And in the long run, actually, the, the long and the short of it is pretty simple. And that is, how do you get well-paid jobs in large numbers produced? If you could do that, I think the Mongolian public would be pretty forgiving of other kinds of corruption stories. But when that's not happening, then attention focuses on leaders who themselves are often becoming very wealthy, their families and their networks becoming very wealthy, but the rest of the population kind of not and waiting for some benefits. So corruption is part of it, but it's, um, but it's also true to say that um, in Mongolia, the perception of corruption is not a simple one. It's not just a question of breaking laws. There's a general worry and concern about um, the rich and powerful feathering their own nests, whether or not they've broken a particular law or not. It's that sensation that um, money is there, but it's not getting spread around very widely that I think it makes a lot of people worried. And they, may, and they are worried about foreign interests, particular, obviously, their great southern uh, uh, neighbour, China. They are uh, quite concerned about limiting Chinese interests 
in their country. Andrew, what do you think about that? Because, uh, as David says, there's this perception that uh, foreign investment is leading to certain leaders in uh, Mongolia feathering their own nests. And people are worried about the country ending up um, more like Nigeria, where you have this whacking great gap between the, the rich and the poor, and it leads to, to conflict and instability. I think this is also part of the so-called resource curse, where the whole country is dependent on one single uh, overweening sector, which is the energy. So I think that the challenge for uh, Mongolia is to broaden the economy um, by investing um, a, great, a, more, a great deal more of its wealth in the essential infrastructure like roads, uh, highways, uh, but also schools and hospitals, and bringing up the skills uh, of its population, and and thereby and, and also maybe broadening the economy in, into manufacturing or other sectors, so as to create, um, as uh, my, my colleagues were saying, uh, jobs uh, for a more broader base middle class, and that would diffuse the kind of distribution of wealth in a way that would, uh, in fact. Uh, could even minimize the corruption. But I think the corruption um, and concentration of wealth is not just in Mongolia, it's in other uh, democracies around the world. I mean, you, 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 there are references to the so-called 1% and the 99%, even in America. But I think the challenge for a small country like Mongolia, where there is so much uh, concentration of uh, national wealth in one single sector, uh, I think the, the immediate challenge is, is to broaden the economy and, in, uh, and, and, and improve the kind of um, uh, governance institutions. Jagal Saken, what do you say to that? I mean, what are po politicians saying about well, combating corruption there? Yeah, two things. Before going the program about diversification of economy, I would like to uh, share with you the uh, general people's opinion about the value of democracy, value of free freedom, protection of human rights, protection of your property. That accepts that value very much accepted by this society during the last 20 years. So people are demanding normal uh, regulation, normal transparent government. And both, gov both, both large political parties, People's Party and the Democratic Party, are putting a, a, the same goal about diversification of economy based on the revenue from uh, mining. And then uh, here and there, some methods are different, but uh, we both see that it can be done uh, with a vibrant, uh, good competition of private sector. I think that's the most important part. And we, we say corruption is high also because we want to have a very fair competition. And we see that the, the country, the private businesses see that they need normal, fair competition not the interference by the government or in related people with the, uh, who are making decisions. That's why this uh, high demand of uh, transparency in the government, if we will overcome that, then uh, the issue of uh, diversification of the economy, using the, all the funds from the revenue, etc., that's, that's the uh, agenda of any party who will take over uh, from tomorrow. So you're expecting a successful election this time round because there was a bit of violence after uh, the last elections, wasn't there? Well, uh, sure. Uh, that was a big lesson for everybody. That's why we have uh, four colonels now, uh, colonels now in prison. That's why we have been start asking the former president, even uh, connected with the uh, certain things we, 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 we believe he should answer. And that's the part of democracy. We are on the way of cleaning the uh, power from our corrupt officials. And I think this election will prove that we are on the right track. And uh, the people, in particular the civic society, people are completely, they are intolerant to uh, two things. One is the mining licenses. The second is a uh, uh, land speculation in Ulaanbaatar city. And we, we expect the president uh, current president will continue after even the election all the way through the whole land speculation in the Ulaanbaatar city, which is a big source of that assumption of corruption in this country. So I think uh, the democracy, the value of free freedom works here, and we want to get uh, fast, better. OK, gentlemen, we have run out of time. It was an interesting discussion. Thank you very much indeed for your contributions. Thank you to all our guests, Jagal Seken Dambadaja, Andrew Lung and David Sneath.
And thank you at home for watching. We're always interested in what you think. Send us an email to insidestory at aljazeera.net. From me, Shudi Ghosh. Bye-bye for now.